Today, I'd like to revisit the subconscious mind chapter from Think and Grow Rich. It was this book that I read in 2004 that introduced me to the idea of the subconscious mind. It was at this time where I was in $50,000 debt. And it was primarily this chapter, along with the auto-suggestion chapter that helped me clear it up, as well as open up my mind to creating multiple streams of income and money showing up in unexpected ways. So today I've gathered some quotes here from Think and Grow Rich, from the chapter for our discussion. Now I've gathered the ones that I feel are helpful and related to our recent discussions, and also where we are today in our understanding of subconscious mind. This is another wonderful thing about revisiting the same books. You find that upon applying the information and producing successes, certain information stands out more so and other information is no longer relevant as to where you are now. Another reason why I recommend the Pareto Principle when learning information. The Pareto Principle is otherwise known as the 80-20 Principle, which although not set in stone, is helpful to keep into consideration when it comes to learning, especially if one finds themselves overwhelmed or overthinking when it comes to information. It suggests that a majority of benefits or outcomes are a result of less inputs. Pareto Principle, when applied to learning, proposes focusing on the 20% of the information that produces 80% of the results. We also find benefit in applying the Pareto Principle to other areas of our lives as well. For example, I remember when I had my IT business, I once took an inventory and found that 20% of my business initiatives were producing 80% of my revenues, and one out of five of my marketing campaigns were producing 80% of my revenues. We could even keep this into consideration in relation to consciousness, where we see the same rule of doing less to achieving more applies. For example, 95% or even more of the optimal results are produced by the power of your subconscious mind, and the rest consciously, and some say even most of that, is also directed by the power of your subconscious mind. The main thing to keep into consideration is that a few things that are accepted as true which for our purpose today, your consciously chosen visions become what is impressed upon the subconscious mind as instructions to allow the infinite power of your subconscious mind to bring into existence, which we can also call infinite intelligence. Infinite intelligence brings forth what you desire, and I also find that it purifies the mind in the process of bringing forth what you desire and by that I mean releases identification to beliefs not true with how you truly desire to be. Napoleon Hill says, The subconscious mind consists of a field of consciousness in which every impulse of thought that reaches the objective mind through any of the five senses is classified and recorded, and from which thoughts may be recalled or withdrawn as letters may be taken from a filing cabinet. It receives and files sense impressions or thoughts, regardless of their nature. You may voluntarily plant in your subconscious mind any plan, thought, or purpose which you desire to translate into its physical or monetary equivalent. So whenever we have a desire of seeing something into existence, we simply allow the infinite intelligence within our subconscious mind to bring it into existence rather than trying to overthink with the conscious mind. Infinite intelligence is the source of all that appears. Look at how intelligent life is, the inventions, artistic expressions, and the way nature works. All of these are sourced from the infinite intelligence within your subconscious mind. Now one part of your subconscious mind is where the impressions of what you desire which are your goals, your visions, your intentions, are stored. These instructions are calling upon infinite intelligence to bring them into existence in the most marvelous ways that, from my experience, a lot of times higher than my conscious reasoning. And that's because infinite intelligence operates by a higher reason, we could say, as he says here. 
The subconscious mind works day and night. Through a method of procedure unknown, the subconscious mind draws upon the forces of infinite intelligence for the power with which it voluntarily transmutes one's desires into their physical equivalent, making use always of the most practical media by which this end may be accomplished. So this is faith. Faith is loyalty to the unseen reality, as stated in 2 Corinthians 5.7. For we walk by faith, not by sight. So consider what it would be like having to try and forcefully figure things out consciously instead of having infinite aspects kept into consideration by the power of your subconscious mind. Not allowing this power to take care of everything for you could result in overthinking, unnecessary force, control, and manipulation. What is suggested here is to allow that all-wise and all-loving unseen power to take care of everything for you by remaining faithful to your vision beyond needing proof, approval, validation, or confirmation from this world which only reflects what was once accepted as true. And by that I mean, if we unnecessarily judge by appearances and relate those inharmonious judgments to our vision, that could result in confusion in mind, and thus faith is the optimal way. Now here's a wonderful thing. This is not new to you. You've done it many times before. Think of moments in your past where you had goals, visions, or as he refers to in Think and Grow Rich, definite chief aims. And you realize them. Speaking of which, I put together two videos recently on the definite chief aim. I'll link in the description to them. So now, upon connecting the dots, looking backwards, I found that the results happen a lot of times in what I call miraculous ways that were perfectly orchestrated. That is the evidence worth reflecting upon the evidence of personal experience, as he says here. There is plenty of evidence to support the belief that the subconscious mind is the connecting link between the finite mind and infinite intelligence. It is the intermediary through which one may draw upon the forces of infinite intelligence at will. It alone contains the secret process by which mental impulses are modified and changed into their spiritual equivalent. It alone is the medium through which prayer may be transmitted to the source capable of answering prayer. So prayer is feeling as real as we've been discussing. Like that's the way it is, the way you imagine. This calls upon the power, and you can apply this in any format you want to fit your style of faith, to accept that your prayers are already answered, in other words, pray as though it is already true. That's the language of faith. Now, in this chapter, he lists what he refers to as seven major positive emotions. And so a way we apply this is, again, by reflecting upon our personal experiences. Notice if, for example, when you thought about what you wanted to experience, the desired outcome, your vision of yourself already in possession of it, that there was probably an emotion mixed with it, like, for example, enthusiasm, which stimulates creativity, inspiration, innovation to bring forth your vision. This is because a thought and emotion combination has a powerful impression on the subconscious mind. Think of, for example, music you love, theater, or a nice book. So let's look at an example where a person experiences fear of rejection. And so, the thought of connecting with someone evokes inharmonious imaginal activity alongside the emotion of fear, causing them to dwell in it, usually because they have not learned how to regulate their emotions. This dwelling could leave a strong impression upon the subconscious mind to repeat the same pattern. If they simply observe the inharmonious imaginal activity and were not polarized to it, and by that I mean identified through their emotion, which to be even more specific, the belief that the emotion is revealing, that is what they could be identifying with. They would easily discern that it is not true and not identify with it, 
reprogramming the subconscious mind ideally in the process. Now, if one develops a healthy relationship with their mind, thoughts, and emotions, they'll find that they can stimulate specific emotions in relation to experiences via a single thought to leave a powerful impression upon the subconscious mind to have more of those kind of experiences that they would like to have when it comes to connecting with others. We could do this with NLP anchoring, for example, which is one of many ways of doing this. Now, I brought up NLP in Sunday's video where we talked about states. If you haven't seen it, I'll link in the description to it. So there's another NLP concept called anchoring that I use that is very powerful. Anchoring into any state via emotion and prompt, which could be a single thought or word or physical sensation. For example, I say the words flow or ideal a lot. They're actually anchor words. When I say them to myself, they bring me into desired states of mind and evoke powerful emotions in relation to those states that keep me anchored into that state. And you can create anchors as well. Let's discuss how. First, recall a memory where you felt inspired around someone. How did it feel like when you were around them? Relax into experiencing those emotions now of how you are both in sync as the connection felt stronger while those emotions were charging up and feel those emotions now. Next, Choose an anchor. It could be a word, a sentence, or it could be something external, like a touch, for example, touching your earlobe. Now recall the memory again and again exactly how it happened in your imagination. As though you are there now, feeling the emotions now in your body from the experience. As you do this, suggest the anchor word in your mind associated with it and or by physical touch of your earlobe if you'd like. Notice as you set the anchor, the emotion that you want to feel, like how you felt it from memory, increases. Do this enough times till it becomes apparently related to the anchor. Then you can test it. Say the word or touch your earlobe or whatever you set as an anchor and notice the emotion coming up. Even if it is at a subtle degree, acknowledge that it's working and the desired emotions are recalled stronger. Then as you apply it often in situations where that emotion is helpful, you'll notice it is easier each time. And as mentioned, you could do this with thoughts as well. So relating thought and emotion together makes for a powerful anchor or we can say an impression on your subconscious mind, which you can recall whenever you'd like to. This is how we have in our lives linked memories to beliefs and emotions. Anchoring here replicates this natural process, although intentionally. Now, this is one way of generating specific emotions from within by your imagination while building that relationship with your subconscious mind. So you can find many ways of understanding yourself to communicate with it in a way that you accept those suggestions easily. And it may be different than how others do it, yet it works perfectly for you, which is related to the next point. He says, prayer does sometimes result in the realization of that for which one prays. If you have ever had that experience, of receiving that for which you pray, go back in your memory and recall your state of mind while you are praying. And you will know for sure that the theory here described is more than a theory. So now the subconscious mind is reprogrammed by repetition, either repetition of the same information, like for example, with auto suggestion or repetition of the same information from different perspectives which means different ways of implying the same impression, which by doing so, you may find more enjoyable. It is also important when reprogramming the subconscious mind to not waver on the ideal programming with conflicting thoughts. And by that, I mean, if one suggests being confident in sales, for example, and then looks for reasons why they are not and or suggesting conflicting thoughts 
in relation to how they see themselves ideally. This could create unnecessary confusion. The state of mind to be in, as referred to here, is certainty, which is faith. It is actually in a calm mind. And for that, I recommend my video I released recently with examples of doing it. I'll link in the description to it. So this state of mind, which is a calm, open mind, like hypnagogic state, for example, which is prior to sleep, which is why many pray before sleep. Here we can easily accept it as being already that way now, how we personally desire it to be, which then the following occurs as he says. The subconscious mind is the intermediary which translates one's prayers into terms which infinite intelligence can recognize, presents the message, and brings back the answer in the form of a definite plan or idea for procuring the object of the prayer. Now, this is also the part synchronistically, which I believe connected me to the next book I read on the topic of subconscious mind, which was The Power of Your Subconscious Mind by Joseph Murphy. And in that book, he said something very similar, which stood out for me, probably more so than other parts of the book, which broadened my understanding of the subconscious mind and the subconscious realm. Joseph Murphy said, The infinite intelligence within your subconscious mind can reveal to you everything you need to know at every moment of time and point of space, provided you are open-minded and receptive. You can receive new thoughts and ideas, enabling you to bring forth your new inventions, make new discoveries, or write books and plays. So this is why I always say, you already know the way to realizing your visions. Listen to yourself and trust yourself. Or as Steve Jobs once said, follow your heart and intuition. Everything else is secondary. And notice how Joseph Murphy said, provided you are open-minded and receptive. Why would a person not be open-minded and receptive to the ideas, plans, steps, or whatever to do or not do that is received with it? Well, exactly what distorts the connection with intuition. It is the unnecessary beliefs that a person is identified with. Now, the wonderful thing is these beliefs are looking to be released. This is part of the mind purification. And by that, I mean releasing beliefs not true with how you truly desire to be. These beliefs seem to create unnecessary confusion, throttle the infinite intelligence connection that gives you the plans and actually moves you along automatically and everything automatically to bring forth your vision. These beliefs thus can also unnecessarily control the power of your subconscious mind in a not so ideal way. The unseen power of your subconscious mind is looking to take care of everything for you, including all that happens in the background. And by this, I mean, appears to move everything behind the scenes, if applicable, to contribute to bringing forth your vision. Watch the recent video I did on how Nikola Tesla applied this alongside some of my personal examples. I'll link in the description to that video. Now, Napoleon Hill consolidates this understanding in the sixth sense chapter. So let's touch upon this as well today. He says, the 13th principle is known as the sixth sense, through which infinite intelligence may and will communicate voluntarily without any effort from or demands by the individual. The sixth sense is the portion of the subconscious mind, which has been referred to as the creative imagination. It has also been referred to as the receiving set, through which ideas, plans, and thoughts flash into the mind. These flashes are sometimes called hunches or inspirations. The sixth sense defies description. It cannot be described to a person who has not mastered the other principles of this philosophy, because such a person has no knowledge and no experience with which the sixth sense may be compared. Understanding of the sixth sense comes only by meditation through mind development from within. The sixth sense probably is the medium of contact between the finite mind and infinite intelligence. And for this reason, it is a mixture of both the mental and the spiritual. It is believed to be the point at which our mind contacts the universal mind. Now, why would he say 
cannot be described to a person who has not mastered the other principles of this philosophy. Well, from my experience of applying this book since 2004, almost 20 years now, those other principles in the book, and you don't need to follow his principles, there are many other principles out there that do the same thing, which is mind purification. That is what they do, which is release identification to unnecessary beliefs in mind, or as he refers to it, mind development from within. So he simply means remain committed to your vision, your definite chief aim, seeing them all into existence, which through the process of realizing your visions, these unnecessary controlling beliefs are brought to awareness and released. And if you'd like to accelerate the process, I recommend my letting go video I released a few weeks ago. I'll link in the description to it. So I trust you enjoyed today's discussion. Uh, revisiting this chapter with the nuances from applying it for almost 20 years, and I trust they were helpful for you. Let's go ahead and conclude this with an auto suggestion to further encourage. You could say, through the power of my subconscious mind, I'm able to see clearly each step along the way as my mind is kept clear by simply being how I truly desire to be, honoring the feeling that is in harmony with my vision, from which I experience the sixth sense, which is clear knowing and understanding of the inner wisdom as clear steps on the journey to realizing my vision, the path of least resistance. If you would like a copy of this mind map, the link is in the description. Thank you very much for watching. I'll talk with you soon. Take care.